broadcasting live from Houston, from the space city to the world, you are watching Now Media Television. Today in Pain Diaries, we'll take a look into the vendor side of pain management behind the scenes. Also, we'll talk with Dr. Mary Tally Bowden. She's board certified in both otolaryngology and sleep medicine. We are debuting a new segment today, Talking Health Insurance with expert April Clark. And finally, we'll give you an option to have more energy and be more efficient during the day. Remember, you can watch us in Houston, 2110, Beaumont, 2710, Atlanta, 2210, Lake Charles, 2110, College Station, 1410, Eagle Pass, 24, Piedras Negras, 24, and hear us in Chicago, 102.9 FM, Mexico City, 98.5 FM, Spotify, Apple Podcast, Amazon Music. And follow us on all social media and our digital platforms such as nowmedia.com. Hello, I'm Dr. Suzanne Manzi from Performance Pain and Sports Medicine, and this is Pain Diaries. <laughs> Here's some advice from the Obesity Medicine Association. Why is physical activity important? You can visit their website at obesitymedicine.org. Why is physical activity important? Regular physical activity can protect your joints, prevent falls and injuries, help anxiety and depression and insomnia. It can reduce your risk of disease such as type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, heart attacks, dementia, and some cancers. Physical activity saves lives, and protects health, exercises medicine. What about aerobic activity? Physical activity guidelines for Americans recommend either 150 to 300 minutes per week of moderate activity. If you break that into 30 minute segments, that's about five times a week at minimum. Or you can do 75 to 150 minutes of vigorous activity or a combination of both spread throughout the week. Completing more than or equal to 300 minutes of moderate activity per week may have additional health benefits, especially after weight loss. Now, how do we define that? Moderate activity is at a pace where you can carry on a conversation. You can't really sing, but you can brisk walk, slow bike, and do water aerobics. Vigorous activity is at a pace where you cannot carry on a conversation. You might really be out of breath, and this is challenging to talk. Examples include jogging or running, swimming laps, playing tennis, or fast bicycling. Activity can be done all at once, or you can split it into shorter segments with no minimum duration per segment. For example, do three bouts of activity for 10 minutes each after a total of 30 minutes of each daily activity. Maybe every time you eat, get up and go for a walk. Now let's talk about strength training. That's my favorite thing to do. Physical Activity Guidelines for Americans recommends that adults do muscle strengthening exercises two times per week to increase bone strength and muscular fitness. Getting started. Limit inactivity. Move more, sit less. Doing both aerobic activity and strength training. That is the best for your overall health and fitness. Any activity counts. Do something fun. If you can't do 150 minutes of moderate activity per week or more, gradually work towards your goal. Design your physical activity program to fit your schedule, and a fitness professional may help you safely achieve those goals. If you have diabetes, heart, kidney, or lung disease, talk with your healthcare provider before starting an exercise program. Most of all, have fun and enjoy being physically active. The best activity is one that you like and enjoy. Medicare considers expanding dental benefits for certain medical conditions. Proposed changes in the Medicare rules could soon pave the way for significant expansion in Medicare-covered dental services, while falling short of the comprehensive benefits that many Democrat lawmakers have advocated. That's because under current law, Medicare can pay for limited dental care only if it's medically necessary to safely treat another co covered medical condition. 
In July, officials proposed adding conditions that qualify and sought public comment. Any change could be announced in November and take effect as soon as January 2023. The review by Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services follows an unsuccessful effort by congressional Democrats to pass comprehensive Medicare dental coverage for all beneficiaries, a move that would require changes in federal law. Among the dental procedures Medicare already covers are wiring teeth to repair a fractured draw, a dental exam before a kidney transplant, and extraction of infected teeth before radiation treatment for certain head and neck cancers. But if a patient needs another kind of organ transplant, Medicare will not cover the eradication of a dental infection so the transplant can proceed. Or if a patient with breast cancer has an infected tooth, Medicare will cover chemotherapy and radiation, but not the tooth extraction needed before that treatment can be provided. If CMS receives sufficient medical evidence, officials said dental services could be covered to detect and eradicate infections before total hip or knee replacement surgeries. The proposal has been criticized because it omits follow-up dental care. Extracting infected teeth has consequences, even when it's needed to eliminate an infection that would otherwise jeopardize potentially life-saving treatment. The Influential Task Force recommends screening children eight and older for anxiety. For the first time, the U.S. Preventive Service Task Force has recommended screening for anxiety in children eight years and older. In its final recommendations, published in the medical journal, journal JAMA, the task force also urged screening for depression in children 12 and older, consistent with recommendations from 2016. Both sets of recommendations apply to children who don't have a diagnosed mental condition and who are not showing recognized symptoms of anxiety or depression. The members considered recommendations on screening for suicide risk in children and adolescents, but said there's not enough evidence on its harms and benefits. According to the U.S. Center for Disease Control and Prevention, between 2016 and 2019, about 5.8 million children were diagnosed with anxiety, and approximately 2.7 million were diagnosed with depression. Poor mental health in U.S. teens exacerbated by negative experiences during COVID-19 pandemic. Poor mental health among teens in the United States was a concern before the COVID-19 pandemic, and major disruptions to school and social life since early 2020 have only exacerbated the situation. A new study from the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention found that most adolescents experienced negative events during the COVID-19 pandemic, and those experiences were linked to higher prevalence of poor mental health and suicide attempts. Nearly three quarters of high school students in the U.S. reported experiencing at least one adverse childhood experience in 2021, such as physical abuse, emotional abuse, food insecurity, or loss of a parent's job during the COVID-19 pandemic. Also included were electronic bullying, dating violence, and sexual violence. Adolescents experiencing one or two adverse events were more than twice as likely to report poor mental health and nearly six times more likely to report a recent suicide attempt compared with those who did not experience any adverse events. And the effects are compounding. About one of every 13 adolescents reported experiencing four or more adverse events during the COVID-19 pandemic. For these students, poor mental health was four times as common as, and suicide attempts were 25 times more common than for those who did not experience any adverse events. The new CDC study was based on responses from more than 4,000 high school students to the 2021 Adolescent Behaviors and Experiences Survey. It does not capture all factors affecting adolescent mental health or suicidal behaviors and does not assess lifetime exposure to the specific adverse childhood events included. But another CDC study published this year found that there were significant increases in high school students reporting persistent feelings of sadness or hopelessness, considering suicide or attempting suicide over the past decade. And they got even worse during the pandemic. We'll be back. Welcome back. I am so honored today to have my little brother from a different mother on the show. Jamie Tipton is one of my favorite people. We've worked together for over 10 years in this Houston market. He also owns his own small business, just like I do, and he's currently crushing it in his medical distributorship, Clutch City Medical, 
is a behind the scenes operation for procedures that are performed on patients. You wouldn't necessarily know about this as a patient, but I wanted to bring this to the table, which is why I decided to have Jamie on the show. Jamie, we've literally been working together for 10 years. It's been a long decade, a wild ride. You saw me from the beginning and I saw you from the beginning. We've only looked up to each other in the space of pain medicine. I'll always be grateful to you for your loyalty and your dedication to patients. You love what you do. You tell me all the time. You feel like you're not even at work, which is amazing. You know, you help me change patients' lives. We've been through so much together. And Clutch City Medical is something you created out of your passion for this space. Why don't you tell me a little bit about your business and what you guys do? Big sis, how are you? Dr. Manzi, no, thank you for having me. Um, sure. So I could probably talk for about 100 hours about, about what we do, but in a nutshell, I mean, look, and you would be the first to back me up on this, is it's such a, a booming, um, innovative space. I mean, it's been this way for years now. And, uh, I, you know, I, I wanted to start a company to partner with practices just like yourself. And in order to partner, I wanted to focus on products that made clinical sense, that helped patients get better, um, that made my doctors more efficient, and just made sense for the practice. And, you know, there's no better place than, than Houston, Texas, in my opinion, to, to start a I mean, a small business, def a small business, and definitely a great place to start a, a med tech company. So, we are what we do day in and day out is we just provide technologies to physicians just like yourself, Dr. Manzi. I mean, as you know, and we were in the OR supporting it. Um, you know, we'll we'll discuss and help educate patients. We're talking to you know nurse practitioners, referring. You know, we help get the word out about our procedures. Um, and, and the clients we work with. So it's kind of an all-encompassing, um, kind of touching all the points and in interventional pain. We don't go into the spine hardware space. We stick traditionally to interventional pain and that's it. And that's what I want to specialize in. Not really a jack of all trades, but we're, we're, we focus on three to four technologies. Awesome, yeah, I've, like we said, we've been working together forever. and. You know, we started off working, you know, with one of the markets and one of the bigger companies. And yeah. it was a newer technology that you brought to me 10 years ago. And I now in this space, that seems to be a common theme. You know, we didn't have many technologies back then. We just were able to do a few procedures and medication management for patients. And now we are so lucky to be in the the revolution of pain management and the space and what's available. So can you take me on a, a, a mission of how you decide to select which company you're gonna work with and what you're gonna bring to the table and why you're bringing that to doctors? No, that's, I mean, that's literally, it's a great question. Cause we get like yourself, right? Every day you have somebody coming in your office trying to talk about a different technology or you know, maybe, hey, let, let's look at this, let's build this, or let's, let's see if we can use this more. And it, there's a lot. Listen, every day I go in an office, I'm like, I don't know how the physicians filter through it. And I think I have a hard time. Um, and, you know, my team has a hard time in terms of, you know, selecting the right technology. And that is 99% of the problem um, with what we do is it's painstaking. And you want to pick the right partners. And you want to make sure the technology works well. You want to make sure that your customers are going to be happy. And so one of the key things that I look at when I'm kind of evaluating a company is, number one, do they have, do, does their coding make sense? Okay. Does this coding make sense? And can, can I walk in and look at you, Dr. Manzi, and you know this about me, look at you and be very honest and straightforward and say, look, here's what we're going to, here's what the code is. And here's what the, some of the payments are, and here's how it's gonna help your patients. And I can't tell you, I lay my head on a pillow at night knowing that all the therapies that we carry here at, at Clutch City Medical and the IVP group, they make sense from a coding standpoint. Um, everything's covered by insurance. And I think that's a big peace of mind for us, number one. Number two, how is the marketing with the company, right? Because at the end of the day, you want a company that's going to be able to support you and also be able to support your physicians with the materials they need to help their practices be successful with the technology. 
And those are the big two points that I wanted to drive home on this question. I mean, it's, it's such a great question and it's hard to do. It really is because you can play, it's a smoke and mirrors game sometimes with some of these companies because everybody, if you ask anybody, I mean, I don't blame them. Everybody's got the best stuff. So you just need to kind of go with your gut, right? And I mean, not it's not a hope kind of thing, but it's more like a, just do your deep research, talk to people. You know, I have loose affiliations with other companies like myself uh, in the space. And so we talk on what they're using and what they've seen success with. And so that's kind of how I filter through. It is tough to do. And frankly, it's a good problem to have both for my company and also for you. Um, it, it just shows that not pe not that people care about the space because that's always been the fact, but it shows that there's a lot of eyes on this minimally invasive spine interventional pain market uh, and, you know, as it grows. So, I mean, I don't know if that answers your question, probably a little bit too long winded, <laughs> but um, that's kind of no, how I filter through. It's perfect. I mean, because you guys are behind the scenes, you know, you're, you're the ones taking these products from the big companies and presenting them to the doctors. And so right. we have to have faith in you as a vendor when you come to us. So we make the right choices for our, our patients. And I don't think a lot of patients understand kind of the decision making that goes in or why, you know, we use certain products that we, that we use for certain treatments. And now, the space has been revolutionized and there's multiple options usually for different treatments and obviously you know as, as a physician i want my patients to have what's best and knowing you i can trust you to also bring what's best to the table because i've known you for so long we have a great relationship and we have the same philosophy when it coming when it comes to treating our patients you know you're going to treat that person like your mom, your grandmother, your dad, your sister, your brother, those kind of people. Um, you just want everybody to have the optimal outcomes. And I think that's huge. You, and you know, honestly too, and you bring up, it's kind of leads me into a segment that I know that you're really passionate about is, as a physician today, when you're looking and evaluating technologies, I think it's important, and correct me if I'm wrong, for the physician to look and create partnerships, like extensions of the practice. You know, so when you select therapies to use, you, you obviously want to use the right therapy, but you also want the right partner. And you want someone who's going to be an extension of your practice day in and day out, and you work together to drive the right outcome for the patient. Obviously, you guys are, you guys are the boss. You guys are in the driver's seat. We're there as the support, and we need to understand not the role that we play. I mean, and it's in the clinic, we're an extension of the practice. In the operating room, we're there for support if we need it, you know, or if you need it. We're, it's, it's a fine line you walk. It's really fun. And honestly, I heard you say before, I don't go to work every day. I mean, my wife knows that. My, I mean, I get up and it is fun for me to go because I, I do really enjoy the clinical side of it, seeing the patients getting better from your treatments. And also, I enjoy the business side of it, too, because I think that's a fun aspect. So it's kind of a double-edged sword for me. And it's, I am blessed to be able to get up. And, and have a company, have a great team, work with great physicians like yourself and, and be able to do this every day. So it's, it's important for the partnerships. I mean, that's, that's the name of the game in today's market. No, that's fantastic. Thank you for that. And now your company has expanded, right? How many, how many staff do you have now working for you? Yeah. So we have, um, so we're working on hiring a couple more people, but we're starting to expand into other areas. Um, we're, we're looking to, always looking at new technologies. I mean, we're up to, I believe it's, I believe we're at six or so. In the and we also uh, have a prior authorization company. And so we do uh, work a lot of our own prior offs with the insurance companies, depending on what therapy is being used, which is also a really, really awesome service that we can offer. Um, so we help kind of the office deal with uh, the insurance companies and getting things approved and, and things like that, which is an important aspect of stuff, uh, as you know. So um, to provide help, get access for the patient to that care. Uh, so yeah, it's growing. It's good. I mean, and it's fun. And you know, I'm just blessed to be able to do it and and have fun every day. I mean, it's stressful, but it's also a good stress. Absolutely. Yeah, you mentioned prior authorization. So a lot of times, so me as the doctor, I order a procedure and this procedure has to get authorized by the insurance company. So the fact that you have 
multiple people working that order. You know, when we submit an order to have this procedure done, the patient's like, when can I have it? Well, when's your insurance gonna approve it? You know, is it gonna take a few days versus a month or two? People don't wanna wait, they are in pain, they want their yeah. procedure now. Yes. And so to have a team working on prior authorizations is fantastic because it's you're improving patient outcomes. They get what they need as soon as possible. Yeah, and I mean, that's a big part of it. And also it takes onus and it takes stress off of, off of your staff, right? Because like we talked about, it all comes back to there's a million things happening in an interventional pain practice. And so, the, you know, I'm, I'm just one piece of the cog. That procedure is one of a million, right? That they've got to get now preauthorized in this, you know, kind of new insurance world, right? So it's, it's just something that we wanted to offer um, it took a little bit to build out because it's, I mean, it is a tedious process, but it has certainly um, been beneficial to the, the customers that we service and the practices. So I'm really excited about it. It's something I have a lot of passion for, um, and, and the physicians and their offices seem to really appreciate it. Thank you. Well, I always love to pair with passionate people, and you're one of my favorites, so I really appreciate you being on the show today. Is there anything else you want to add? Do you want people to know about Clutch City Medical? No, I think, you know, I think we encompassed it all. Um, I just want to say that I, I just, I, I enjoy working with you. We, we've just been such a duo for 10 plus years. Um, just everything you've done for me and, and it's just, I can't even put into words. Um, you're my big oh. sister. I got a lot of love for you. And it just gives me the chills to, to even be on here hanging out with you. So I appreciate it. I'm so happy to have you here. Thank you so much and look forward to having you back on the show. Would love to come back. Take care. <laughs> Thank you. It's time to go to a commercial break. Coming up next, we'll have a brand new segment with insurance expert April Clark, who will answer all your questions on that matter. Remember, I'm Dr. Suzanne Manzi with Performance Pain and Sports Medicine, and you're watching Pain Diaries. <music> Hi, welcome back. Dr. Suzanne Manzi here. I have Dr. Mary Tally Bowden as my guest today. Thank you so much for being on Pain Diaries with me. Thank, I brought you. Uh, thank you, Suzanne, for having me. Absolutely. I brought you on as my special guest because I wanted people to hear some of the struggles we go through as physicians. Sometimes we don't agree with what's made to be mainstream. As a physician, this could be challenging. It brings pain to our practice, our lives, our businesses, and to our families. You have a very cool setup down the street from my practice. Breathe MD is on the corner of Kirby and Richmond in Houston, Texas. Our job as physicians is to educate people about what we believe. I know our training starts way back when, when we graduate medical school with a white coat ceremony. We enter med school, we take the Hippocratic Oath. The most important thing we vow to do is do no harm. So first, I just wanna allow you to introduce us to Breathe MD. So tell me about your current practice. Thank you. So I'm a ENT, ear, nose, and throat doctor and sleep medicine specialist. And I started my current practice about three years ago, essentially six months before the pandemic started. And what happened was I, I worked in a private practice for about eight years and that was great. And then I had some kids and I said, I'll take a little time off to raise my children. And that time off it became an extended period of time, seven years. And then I had a little itch that I needed to scratch. And I said, I'm gonna go back, but I'm gonna go back on my own terms. I'm gonna be, I may not be very successful, but I'm gonna be a happy doctor. And I didn't want third parties telling me how to practice medicine. And unfortunately, money is part of that control, right? Um, and so what I decided to do is set up a cash only practice. And that way I'm not beholden to insurance companies, I'm not beholden to the government, I'm not beholden to a hospital, I'm only beholden to my patients. So I started this practice and I was a very quiet, uh, slow ENT practice. Um, and basically, you know, as an ENT doctor, you see patients with respiratory illnesses and people would come to me at the beginning of the pandemic sick and wondering what to do and how to get tested. and I had already been working with a lab for patients with chronic sinusitis and they had a PCR test for bacterial infections of the sinuses and they came out with a saliva test for COVID. So 
this was great because it was contact free. Patients loved it because you didn't have to have a uh, swab stuck up your nose. And we were also able to get our results back very quickly. You might remember early on in the pandemic, it was taking two plus weeks to get results back. And so we were getting results back in 24 hours. And so our little quiet practice essentially exploded because of COVID. And so what would happen is I'd tell people, when they now go back, you know, when they test positive, I'd tell them to go see their primary care doctors. And then they'd come back to me and say, well, my primary care doctor is either they're not open or they told me there's nothing we can do or they said, just go to the emergency room. Well, this did not really sit well with me and I didn't really know what to do with them either, but I at least tried and I started off just doing breathing treatments check for secondary infections, give them antibiotics when necessary, give them steroids when necessary. And I started having success. And then monoclonal antibodies came on the scene and I started doing monoclonal antibodies for patients. And then I started doing more of the ivermectin, hydroxychloroquine and things like that. Um, so basically in the last, since the pandemic began, I have got, gained a tremendous amount of experience treating COVID patients. I've treated over 4,300 patients and everybody that received early treatment has survived. Well, that also made me a target and I was uh, called out by the hospital that I had privileges at, Houston Methodist. And I had privileges there only as a backstop. As an ENT, I do outpatient surgery. I rarely have to admit anybody, in the pa anybody to the hospital. And in fact, I have never admitted anybody to, ho to Methodist Hospital. But they called me out on Twitter. They notified the Houston Chronicle that they were suspending my privileges for spreading dangerous misinformation and causing potential harm to the community. So that created a lot of um, unnecessary drama in my life. Um, so that's, that's been painful. Um, but there, you know, with the pain, there's also been a lot of gain. It's, it's been very rewarding to help the patients that I've been able to help and to see such great results with people getting early treatment. Thank you. I know, you know, I've reached out to you early on in the pandemic too because I needed help and I knew I, I couldn't figure out who to trust back then early on in the pandemic. So I know a lot of people are just confused with misinformation that's out here. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows what's what. Nobody mm -hmm. knows who to believe, where to go, what to do. Where would you say the best information on COVID is out there now that you know we're still in the pandemic? Obviously, things have a lot has returned to normal, but mm -hmm. it's still not normal normal. So, right. where's the best place to find this information on COVID that's trustworthy? Right. Well, I initially got most of my information from flccc.net, and that's sort of where I learned how to use hydroxychloroquine, ivermectin, the vitamins, that sort of thing. Uh, so that's a, a great resource. They've got lots of protocols on there. They've got lots of su suggestions. It's very science-backed as well as experience-backed. So there's always a, a mix. You know, there's only so much you can learn from reading research papers, but it's the people that are actually applying that data and seeing how people respond, which is really important. Um, so you know, Fauci can read all the papers he wants, but he's not out there actually treating patients and seeing how people respond. So I love FLCCC. There is a uh, newer online forum called DMED, it's deconstructedmedicine.com, and it's a place where you can interact with frontline doctors, experts in COVID, and get your questions answered and sort of learn uh, the latest information out there that's not you know, biased by big pharma and it's not censored. Uh, if you go to globalcovidsummit.com, you can get to that link. Uh, so those are my two go-to places for reliable information. Awesome, I'll definitely have to check those out as well. Um, I'm, again, you know, what happened to you is insane in my, in my world. I mean, we've worked so hard to get to where we are so we can help patients survive and live and be functional. For me, it's functionality and feeling well, you know, with without pain and for you it's you know the, the respiratory diseases like all we want to do is to help people and now I mean how do you take action against medical t tyranny and censorship I, it's outrageous yes it's hard I mean I think the nice thing is there's been a ground swelling of support and not everybody can mm -hmm. has a voice that's, that can be heard but there are little things that we can all do to support medical freedom um, 
one thing I did yesterday, I sold my stock in JP Morgan, I sold my stock in Google, Microsoft, um, what was I, oh, yeah, everything, you know, look at where, where your money is. And I was shocked, I had a huge portion of my uh, investments in these companies that have basically kicked me, I've been kicked off Twitter, I've been kicked off LinkedIn, I'm almost kicked off of YouTube, I'm, I'm on thin ice. Um, but look at where your money is invested and pull your money out if, if, you, if you don't support those companies. Um, you know, just getting active on social media because this is an information war. And these social media companies um, need people interacting. And you can, you can fight back, but you can also support the social media entities that support free speech, like Gab, like, like Getter, uh, like Truth Social, like this new online forum I, I was telling you about, the DMED. Um, rumble uh, as opposed to YouTube. So, you know, using, con and, uh, using content that supports free speech and supports medical freedom. Great. That's really great information. So, let's go to a more positive note. Um, you know, you started this cash-based practice and you weren't expecting it to explode and <laughs> in a good way. Um, you know, so most of us are held to insurance contracts, like you said before, and you chose to not have to do that, which is, you know, we all envy that to some degree because I'm just the messenger. Like, why can't I have that procedure? Oh, well, your insurance doesn't even cover that procedure. I'm so sorry, but I signed a contract with them and you chose that insurance. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry you chose bad insurance and I'm sorry I'm on their list of doctors. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's explaining this to patients is difficult sometimes. So. Can you tell us more about um, you know a, a concierge type mm -hmm. practice and cash based practice and how how it's just a, it's a niche? Mm -hmm. niche I, th I think it's growing. I think this is a prime time for people to really re-examine their healthcare plans and figure out a better way to do things because you can do concierge care that's affordable. That's where I like to think of myself as affordable concierge care. I have all my prices on my website. You know, I, I do charge, ca I'm cash only for surgery, but a lot of times people, their insurance plans are so bad that, you know, they're functionally uninsured. So they have such a high deductible that they're essentially paying cash. And if they go to Texas Children's Hospital to get their tonsillectomy, they might pay $10,000. Where if they go to me to get a tonsillectomy, they might pay a fraction of that, three, I can't remember, $3,000, something like that. So um, it's, and you know, we need insurance for catastrophic situations. So you get in a car accident, you get cancer, we, we need, that's an appropriate place for insurance coverage. But for the more day-to-day -day things, I mean, you don't use your auto insurance to get your oil change, right? This is the same thing for healthcare. You know, there's, there are hybrid plans that give you much lower um, premiums and maybe your deductible's higher, but if you combine that with more affordable primary care, then it, it, you get a much better deal. And there's something called direct primary care, which is, it's kind of like joining a health club. So you spend a certain amount every month, usually $100 to $200, depending on the number of people. And that gives you unlimited access to your doctor. It gives you a lot better care, a lot better service. Um, and, you know, they're not necessarily like-minded with COVID, so there's, there's that, um, but they're more independent-minded and they're not going to be beholden to your insurance company in terms of what kind of care you get, what kind of medication you're prescribed, that sort of thing. Thank you so much for enlightening us on that. Is there anything else you think we need to know? Well, I, the biggest worry I have is that the pandemic's gonna end and people are gonna forget about the lessons will not have been learned. So I, I encourage people just to stay involved. If it, this has certainly lit a fire in me that I didn't have before, and it's hard to keep plugging along at it, but you know, wars take time to win, and we are, we're not in a bloody war, but we are definitely in an information war, and we need to keep at it and just keep plugging away, and eventually we will overcome this. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you being here. Thanks so much for having me. No problem. So remember, check out Breathe MD with Dr. Mary Talley Bowden and her, her resources that she provided to us. Um, 
just to prevent more misinformation out there. So let's look to the facts. So it's time to go to a commercial break right now. Remember, I'm Dr. Suzanne Manzi with Performance Pain and Sports Medicine. You're watching Pain Diaries. We are back with more Pain Diaries. Today, we have a brand new segment, Talking Insurance with April Clark. April, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you for having me on Pain Diaries. I am a licensed health insurance agent. My name is April Clark, and I'm licensed in about 35 states across the United States. So um, if you have questions, you know, I can, I can answer those questions wherever you're at. There are, believe it or not, there's diff different laws with health insurance, depending on the state you're living in. Um, so I'm here today to answer some questions that I often get about health insurance. And first off, I, I want to share why, I, like, who wakes up one day and says, I want to be a health insurance agent, right? Um, the reason I got into this career or, um, is, is basically my sister. Um, she was diagnosed with cancer at a young age and she, she at the time had a, had a job with an employer, um, had very good coverage. And after being off for so much time, she ran out of her benefits and went on disability coverage. And I got to see the difference between her benefits and the doctors and treatment she received you know, being on a comprehensive insurance plan versus something not as, as uh, maybe, I don't good. And uh, that really made me passionate about, you know, making sure people are educated about what their options are. So the first question I get a lot is, you know, how much will it cost? What is the premium? And uh, how do I pay it and how often? So it really depends on the policy. Um, to give you kind of a ballpark, take your age, and times it by 10. And that will give you some kind of idea. So like, let's say you're 40, you can think, okay, it might be about 400 a month. Okay. And then it's going to depend on which plan you choose. So you're going to find plans that are a little more than 400 and a little less than 400. Um, but that'll give you a ballpark number. And um, how do I pay it? Um, it really depends. Most of the time it's a monthly premium. So you pay it monthly uh, directly out of your bank and, and how often, again, typically monthly, um, if you're, if you're buying your own insurance and it's not offered through your job. Um, another question I get is how much is the deductible and, and what is a deductible? So typically what a deductible means is it's the amount you have to pay each year towards your medical expenses before your insurance starts paying a portion of the bill or the bills. Um, deductibles range. I mean, there's, there's a huge range typically on the low end, maybe 3000 uh, for an individual policy or a small group policy all the way up to say 10,000 and, and usually everywhere in between the average for an individual policy right now is about 8,500. And then for a family, um, you'd be looking at about 17,000, 17,400 for a family is the average, uh, deductible. And, um, and then what is my out of pocket max? So most policies, not all, most policies do have an out of pocket max. And what that means is the maximum you're going to pay towards your expenses for the year. And then the insurance pays the hundred percent of the difference. Okay. So as an example, maybe you have a hundred thousand dollar hospital bill. Okay. Um, you get appendicitis, you have your appendix removed. You're in the hospital an extra day because there's a little complication. It costs a hundred grand. Okay. If your max out of pocket is say 7,000 or 10,000, you're going to end up owing that amount. And then the insurance company would pay the other, the remaining balance. So if you have a $10,000 max out of pocket, you're going to pay 10. The insurance company pays 90,000. Okay. Um, and that pays off your bill in, in its entirety. Um, another example, which, which, you know, unfortunately happens all too often is say cancer or a really bad car accident. A lot of people think that if they're in a car accident, their car insurance pays their, their medical bills. Um, that is very inaccurate. Unfortunately, your policy typically covers maybe 30,000, 15,000 towards your medical bills, but typically being in the ER for even half a day um, can, can accumulate that amount of bills. 
So, so you definitely need health insurance to pick up the difference. And, and of course, God forbid cancer, something major like that, something that's going on for a while. Um, if you're wanting treatment, I've seen bills ranging from about half a million to a million and upwards. So again, if you have a million dollars in claims for the year towards your cancer treatment, your max out of pocket's 10,000, then basically you're going to be out of pocket 10,000. The insurance company is going to pay the other 990,000. Okay. Um, what are the most important, the next question, uh, what are the most important variables to consider when choosing a plan? That's going to depend on the person and what's important to that person. Um, what I can say to you for, again, someone who's dealt with, not with ju just clients, but also family and having to deal with um, some pretty shocking, unexpected medical situations. One thing you need to consider is knowing what doctors or hospitals you will have access to. Okay. Um, so, so for example, if you have a PPO, there's two types of PPOs. There's usually a state, like an in-state PPO and a nationwide PPO. Okay. If you're in-state and you have a PPO, that means you can go to basically any doctor in the state and the insurance company is going to pay some benefits towards that claim depending if you're in network or out of network. Um, but you're gonna have, the insurance company is going to contribute towards your bills if you have a PPO in the state. If you have a nationwide PPO, that means you can go to any doctor or hospital in the country, okay? You live in Texas, say you wanna fly to um, maybe the Mayo Clinic, um, you're gonna have coverage there, okay? It doesn't matter that it's out of state. And again, whether you're in network or out of network, they have to contribute towards, towards the uh, claims. And um, so if you want to have your you know, best choice of doctors, you don't want to have to necessarily get permission of who you can see. And God forbid, if something unusual or rare happens, you want to make sure that you can get the care you need, then having a PPO is really important. Um, HMO, HMO, basically what that means is, is you have to stick with their group of doctors. So I've seen scenarios with some HMOs where, you know, um, I had someone reach out to me, they, they, their mother was diagnosed with a, a form of cancer and there was no doctor, no doctor in the entire HMO network that, that specialized in that type of cancer treatment. And that means that her insurance isn't going to contribute. Okay. So literally she's going to die from that cancer, um, or, or pay out of pocket for that cancer treatment. Um, because the insurance is not responsible to pay out of network costs. Okay. If it's something immediately life threatening, something where, you know, you're in the middle of a heart attack, you're going to die in less than 24 hours, then your HMO is responsible um, for out of network expenses. But, but you definitely don't want to be in a situation where, where the insurance company gets to decide whether or not they want to pay the claim. Um, and that, that's why having a PPO is, is, is helpful. A, a common problem I see. Is sometimes people, you know, often don't have any health problems. So they don't really understand the importance of having a PPO or being able to choose their doctors because they don't go to the doctor. Okay. But just understand if and when something does happen, if you want to be able to choose who you go to, then having a PPO is really important. Um, another obviously thing to consider is, is price, budget. Um, again, whether you have coverage when you travel. Okay, a lot of plans don't try to travel outside the state or even maybe outside your county. And um, another is if you have coverage while you're at work. Okay, so as an example, I'm a health insurance agent. Sometimes I go and meet clients or go to small companies and meet with the owners and the employees. And if I want to make sure I have coverage while I'm walking into their office, let's say I fall, trip, break my ankle, whether or not my policy, my health insurance policy covers me. Um, while I'm at their office doing work-related activities, okay? Most policies do not. Most policies require a workman's comp claim for something like that. But there are some, some special policies that do. You can actually avoid those workman's comp claims, um, save money every month, and uh, know that you have exactly what coverage you have chosen for yourself if you do get hurt with a work-related injury. Uh, another question is my regular doctor covered again, depends what insurance policy you choose and who your regular doctor is. So if you have a PPO, then yes, your regular doctor should, should be covered. Um, if you have an HMO, 
depends if they're in network. Um, and of course that can change at any time. So, so another thing you want to make sure when you're dealing with an HMO is, is your network, your policy might run from say January and December, but your network could change or whether your doctors in the network could change at the blink of an eye. So, you know, in February, maybe your doctor was in network, but March 1st, they decided they're no longer in network. And now you have no coverage of that doctor. And you are responsible to know those things, okay? It's not the insurance company's responsibility to, to let you know. You need to know whether your doctor's covered or not. So that's important. Um, and then another question, who's going to be my regular point of contact um, when dealing with my insurance policy or having questions? Would it be my insurance company or my agent? And that's really gonna depend on your agent, okay? So me and my, my agents on my team, my, my clients, our clients, um, we are the point of contact for our clients. So maybe they need to make an address change. Um, we can help with that. Maybe they want to know if their doctor's in network. Um, we can help with that. Or, uh, you know, if they're needing special treatment at a facility, whatever that might be, we can always help with those questions. Whereas with some agents, you know, again, you'd have to ask the agent, they're going to have you call the the number on the back of your insurance card, the 1-800 number, and then you'd be dealing directly with the insurance company. Okay, so um, hopefully that answers some of your, you know, basic questions about health insurance. And, and what I do is I specialize in small business owners, self-employed individuals, usually companies with less than 50 full-time employees. Um, I'm able to help them get, you know, comprehensive coverage and, and oftentimes save them money. Um, so if you do have questions, please reach out. Um, you can see on the bottom my, my uh, Facebook business page, my website, as well as my phone number. And um, my email address is not there, but that's okay. Um, my email, I'll, I'll let you know, is April A. Clark. Don't forget my middle initial, April A. Clark 222 at gmail.com. And so if you want to email me, of course, you're welcome to do that. And I'm happy to answer questions. And also I do provide free consultations. So if you're just wanting to compare maybe what you have, or even just understand what you have, um, I'm happy to do that as well. So thanks again so much for having me on Pain Diaries and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much, April. What fantastic information. Next, if you're a business owner and work all day, you might feel tired at the end, but what if you can get more energy to be more productive and have better performance? Well, you might be interested in what our next guest has to say. She's Marissa Burris from My Vital C. Welcome, Marissa. Thank you, Pain Diaries, for allowing me to participate in this space. Just like you, I have always liked to help people and educate. I was a high school teacher for almost 15 years here in Houston, and I have a business experience for many years. And I know a lot of entrepreneurs and people who are looking for alternatives, like you're saying, to be healthier and have mental clarity and more energy, especially sleeping better. So what do we have out there? Our company, My Vital C, is a local company based here in Houston. And I'm here to tell you a little bit about our products and our fascinating story about why we exist. So what could help us improve our immune system, have more energy, sleep better? My name is Marisa Burris from My Vital C. We are a Houston company, like I said, and we have been manufacturing and selling a molecule that was discovered in the late 1980s at Rice University. And our product, was using a body study in University of Paris in 2012. They published these studies and they started mentioning our company as the provider of this product. So people started calling us. So in, two, in 2017, we created our own uh, product for a human consumption. This is fascinating and it's about being in the right time in the right place. And I wanna explain a little bit more about this story so you understand how this molecule could potentially help you. So in 1985, at the University of Rice, Rice University in Houston, three scientists, Dr. Smiley, Dr. Croto, and Dr. Curl, discovered the third form of carbon. 
the scientist community realized that it was an extremely significant discovery, and in 1996, they gave, gave the Nobel Prize to this scientist. It was believed that this molecule would be used in such important things as medicines, plastics, and detergents, and would ultimately become a material used throughout modern society. So now I'm going to tell you about the pinnacle study, and then I'm going to share how to stay safe if you decide to try this molecule. In 2012, scientists from the University of Paris did a study for, to check if this product was toxic. But what was fascinating is that rather than being toxic, this published and peer-reviewed research ended up being the longest longevity experiment on mammals known to man still to the day. Not only was the carbon formula found to be non-toxic, it actually made the rat live almost twice as long as the control group. And what was most surprising, in addition to living almost twice as long, none of the rats that received our formula died with tumors. Unlike the control group that died with tumors as is common in rats. Now, it's important to understand a distinction with this study as it relates to the raw material Carbon-60 is for industrial applications, and there is peer review published research showing that carbon-60 was improperly processed. If it's improperly processed, it can be harmful. Our MyVaralsi products contain ES-60, which is carbon-60 that has been processed for a safer human consumption, and is the material used in this original study. So if you decide to try this amazing molecule, be sure to get the high purity ES-60. But now let me tell you about five ways that our MyVaral C formula with ES-60 could support your immune system. And remember, all this is based mostly in testimonials. Number one, ES-60 has non-antibacterial properties. Why would it better to support your immune system with MyVaral C? Well, this can help you to protect you because when you're fighting bacteria, you can get sick. Number two, ES-60 is a non-antiviral. In the late 90s, carbon-60 was identified as an inhibitor of HIV replication. So we have some studies, on, they have some studies on that. Number three, our formula with ES-60 is an anti-inflammatory because it's found also in anti-inflammatory diet, easy to include in the Mediterranean diet. Mediterranean diet is known for people who live longer than average. ES-60, number four, is an antioxidant. There is at least one study showing that C60 is an antioxidant 172 times more powerful than vitamin C. And Number five, ES-60 can help sleep better. If you sleep better, you improve your mental, physical, and emotional health. These are all key factors in a healthy immune system. I remind you that I am not a doctor and this product has not been evaluated by the FDA. It's not a drug that will cure or prevent any sickness or disease. So if you are interested in trying my vital C, please go to our website www.vitaless60.com Send me a message at marisa, M-A-R-I-S-S-A at myvitalc.com or follow us in social media, Instagram at vitales60 and also we have a YouTube channel uh, it's called vitales60. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marissa. That was awesome. So I all want to thank everybody for being here today on Pain Diaries. Again, I'm Dr. Suzanne Manzi with Performance Pain and Sports Medicine, www.performancepain.com. You can reach out, 346-217-1111. We'd love to help you. This is Dr. Suzanne Manzi with Pain Diaries. Remember, take care of you so you can take care of business.
This has been a Now Media Television feature presentation. All rights reserved.